This last presentation is an explanation of my career path and how it has changed over the years. And of course, as a geoscientist, you have to be a little bit flexible of what career path that takes. So I give this talk to other students who are geoscience um, career path oriented. So maybe throughout this semester, you've learned something and thought, you know, maybe I could be a geologist or a geophysicist or a geoscientist. And this is my wisdom of what that future might look like as a geoscientist. And uh, maybe some of the things that I talk about here are related to your career path, even if it's not in the sciences, and hopefully impart some of that wisdom onto you. So some of the stuff you already know, um, if you've watched my lectures and you know some things about me, I've introduced myself early on in the course, but at least this gives you a little bit of a refresher of um, my background and my um, my interests. So um, I'm originally from Colorado. I have my bachelor's of science from the Colorado School of Mines in Geophysical Engineering and my Master of Science from Texas A&M University. I've had industry experience with internships through the open pit gold mining, software development, groundwater modeling, and oil and gas. Um, I've worked at small companies and large companies and now with the government and of course teaching um, community college. Now, I gave a lecture on what geophysics is, but um, I certainly didn't know what geophysics was. And maybe in this uh, context of this course, you learned something new because not everyone knows what geophysics is. Um, I chose geophysics just based on happenstance. I knew that I wanted to go into math and sciences in some form. So I went to uh, the Colorado School of Mines, which was an engineering school within you know the state. They provided me in-state tuition, which was a big uh, a big decision factor for me. And uh, I thought I was gonna go into electrical engineering or something. And I had no idea what my major would be. But once I um, got to school and learned about the geophysics program and someone told me, you know, you get to be outside and you get to use computers and you get to use physics and math and all of these things, it kind of clicked for me of thinking about, well, that might be a good discipline um, based on my interests. And so, Becoming a geoscientist wasn't something that I knew from a young age or something. I know that some students have that rock collection and they love it and they dream about, um, you know, being in the field and collecting rocks and doing all that. Um, that certainly was not the case for me and it may not be for you and that's okay. You don't have to know what you want to be when you grow up um, because most adults don't want to don't know yet either. Like I, you know, it's ever changing. That target is always moving. So I might be a geophysicist now, but um, who knows what my career path will, will change and will be like in the future. Um, so geophysics is the non-invasive study of the subsurface through measurement, analysis, and interpretation of physical fields at the surface. We talked about the use of geophysics in oil and gas exploration development, groundwater, geohazards, archaeology, forensics, uh, infrastructure, unexplored and ordinance, and the list goes on. There's so many different applications um, for geophysics. And of course, we're so cool that we're in the movies. Um, you may have seen the movie The Core, which is where a geophysicist investigates the Earth's magnetic field. Um, uh, here's Pierce Brosnan in Dante's Peak. Uh, he's a geologist, actually, but he, he detects tremors uh, associated with the uh, volcanic eruption. Then, of course, we have ground penetrating radar looking at dinosaur bones in Jurassic Park. And like I've mentioned in previous lecture, There Will Be Blood is, um, is the story of being a, um, an oil tycoon uh, in California. And so I like to think of some of my career path has followed that of Mr. Plainview and that I started in Central Valley, California and uh, looked towards the coast. And now I work uh, in the offshore uh, regulatory environment. My day-to-day -day job, not my teaching job, is I do production and accounting for offshore oil and gas volumes. That's, that's a lot of like getting emails, printing documents, filing them. I look at digital records often, um, making sure that they're accurate. I do sometimes permit reviews um, for uh, operators that are performing tasks offshore, like um, if they're drilling a new well or modifying a well or even well abandonment. And I also look at some potential resources that could be available to uh, the region in the future. So, you know, I think maybe some of you can relate in that you have an expectation of what your job will be and, you know, that reality changes. <laughs> 
quite a bit. So, you know, when you think about working offshore and you see the platforms uh, from the beach, you think, oh my gosh, how exciting to be able to go visit those platforms. So you think, yeah, this is going to be me every day taking the helicopter and looking at stuff and doing stuff. Um, but the reality is that, uh, you know, I always have Excel up and running um, or I always have files and paperwork um but you know now the new reality is working from home and um the the joke is that my dog takes my zoom calls for me this is my dog pepper so we talk about a career path it's never straight and this is going to be for you as well no matter what career path you go into and you think about what those goals might be and maybe some of those things that your parents are saying you know okay you have to graduate um, high school and then from high school you have to go to college and then from college, you have to go get a job. And then once you're in the job, you do the job and maybe you want to become a manager or uh, whatever that might look like. And then the end goal is to retire comfortably, um, you know, with financial stability. But all those things, uh, that's a pretty straight line. But of course, things change in between, you know. Right now, we're not doing a lot of travel. But of course, that was something that, that I really liked to do. Um, maybe you have to move or you have family changes. Uh, you decide to start a family or you have to take care of a family member or you have a career crisis change and you need to you need to change your uh, your whole degree, go back to school or maybe someone is sick in the family or or there's all these things that can happen. Uh, and we just have to deal with them. And sometimes that means you go back to your original thought of where you would be and so on and so forth. Um, maybe the end goal is still retirement uh, and retiring financially stable, but you have all these other things that are happening in between as well. So when I went to undergrad, I chose um, the Colorado School of Mines. It's a small engineering school in Golden, Colorado, where Coors beer is brewed. Uh, when I went, the gender ratio was about 30% female and 70% male. I think that's about what it is today. It might be closer to 40% uh, to female and 60% male. Um, why I chose that school is because it was a great school. It was an engineering school. It's highly ranked. Um, but more importantly, it was in-state tuition, and that was a big deal for me, making that decision of how much college costs. So the only words of wisdom I have for you, if you're thinking about transitioning from community college or getting your degree from a community college and maybe going to um, you know, a California State University, my words of wisdom are, it's, it's okay, it's difficult, I know it is, but you have to get the degree. You need to get and you need to finish your degree. And of course, as being a scientist, I recommend that if you do go into the sciences, that you get a science degree, not a bachelor's of arts, if you can get a bachelor's of science. Now, I've had the um, fortunate opportunity to have internships. And of course, in other disciplines, you'd have um, the possibility of internships as well. And internships are great because it's a trial for not only different types of companies, but types of jobs. It's a great opportunity to see what, uh, what it's like in a company. But it can also be a process of elimination. For me, I worked in, um, you know, I worked in the field and I said, oh, I'm not very good at the field. I don't like being in the field every day. So you go to an office and you say, I don't really like the office. So it could be, you know, a process of elimination for you as well. Um, of course, having internships is a great way to boost your resume and for you to stand out as an applicant if you are starting to look for a full time job. A lot of companies that do offer internships sometimes use that as a stepping stone, stepping stone for hiring right after college. So you might do a summer intern there, and then they have a program where if you were in the summer program the previous year, then you can get hired on full time after you graduate. Of course, I recommend that you find paid internships. I know that's not always easy, but um, you're, you're worth it. So you should try to find paid internships if you can. The government provides a lot of summer internship opportunities, so I highly recommend that if you're in that boat and you aren't quite sure um, how to how to find those, um, you can search for them on USA Jobs, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit more info in the, at the end of this presentation. Some large corporations have structured intern programs where you jump in and it's very structured of like you do two weeks of this and you do the training and you have the project and you do this and it's a very um, like you're with a cohort of people. So sometimes looking for those opportunities are, are really great because you get a lot of training and you get a lot of hands on and it has a lot of structure. Um, 
And of course, there's probably local companies that might offer an internship without having a structural, a structured intern program. So you might be able to jump in and learn some skills uh, during your summer break between um, between semesters or uh, if you're between going to community college and going to um, a Cal State college or something like that. So my first internship was working in an open pit gold mine in Cripple Creek, Colorado. I was a geophysics intern using ground penetrating radar to investigate subsurface voids. I got that job because I was physically the closest applicant. My home address was physically closest to the mine. And I also passed a drug test, which not everyone was able to do. And so that's how I become the applicant. It really had nothing to do with my background, my skill set. Um, I was just a, a physically close person. And um, sometimes uh, that's just the luck of the draw. And I'd say that that was quite lucky for me to get that opportunity. One of the things that I did learn about that was that it was a lot of field work. I wasn't very good in the field every day. And being a young female in the mining industry was certainly out of my comfort zone. What I did learn about that process is that, well, I learned quite a bit about the mining business. I learned about new equipment and I learned about software which led to my second internship, which was working with a develop, software development company that produced the software that I used the previous summer in the mine. So I developed, um, I was doing um, programming and testing the, to the technical software. And I was writing code and code was very challenging for me. Um, I wasn't particularly good at programming. And so that was one of those uh, good opportunities for me to say, scratch that one off the list. Um, but what was useful about it is that was my first job as uh, in an office setting. So you get to learn how to be professional and how to give professional presentations. And those are all skills that are very useful too. My third internship was the uh, was an environmental science intern at Argonne National Lab near Chicago, Illinois, where I did groundwater modeling and data management. And I got that job because I applied on USA Jobs and I had some software modeling experience, so that was applicable to me as a candidate for this particular job. Um, I moved across the country for this job without knowing anyone or, or having family nearby. Didn't know anyone in Chicago, so I just um, packed my car and moved. And so that was a bit scary, but also a good experience for me because um, I needed to push myself and go outside my comfort zone, meet new people, and, um, and get that experience. So I certainly liked working in the environmental industry and I got a lot of experience of what it's like to work in the government, um, which is a bit different than working for a private sector. And of course, working for the government, um, you have uh, a sense of um, professionalism and um, workflows that are a little bit um, uh, not as necessarily up to date as some of the um, private companies that have the the tip top software and things like that. So um, in this particular case, I did learn some skills that were useful to my studies as, um, as a master's student. Now, my last internship was with an oil and gas company in Houston. It was with Stone Energy Corporation, and I worked a project in the Gulf of Mexico and the shelf. And I got that job just from a friend of mine who had interned there the summer before, and he had a good experience and recommended that I um, get in touch with them. So it was really just through networking that I was able to get this job. And what I learned about it was that, well, this was something that actually I was pretty good at and I liked it. And so I learned basic skills of the oil and gas industry. I learned some new software skills. And of course, that's what um, launched me into my career as a geophysicist in the oil and gas industry. So when I went from undergrad to grad school, um, this may not necessarily be per pertinent to you, but it might be in the future. Um, some of the recommendations that I give for people who are interested in going to grad school and deciding whether or not to go to grad school is that um, you should go to a different school for grad school than you did as undergrad. And I think that's because it pushes you to find the right program, find the right fit, be an applicant and push yourself outside of your comfort zone. Some of the things that I researched um, for a grad school program that I think is important is that you have to understand if the professor has published and if they're letting their students graduate. Now, I have some horror stories of, of friends and colleagues who were in grad school for years and years and years because their professor uh, liked having them as 
um, a lab tech or something. And so they prolonged their graduation. Now, if you're on a fast track to getting out of school, which was what I was trying to do, I certainly didn't want to be a grad student for years and years and years. So that was one of the important things for me in researching a grad program. Of course, I found funding opportunities through research or scholarships, fellowships, and teaching assistantships, which was my first dabble into um, teaching as a teaching assistant um, for a physical geology class. And I went to school at Texas A&M University in College Station, which is a very large university, has 40,000 plus students, and had programs in the arts and sciences with a diverse student population, which is quite different than my undergrad. Um, I got my master's of science in geophysics. I had a teaching assistantship teaching physical geology. Uh, and then the following year I had a fellowship. So I was able to have my grad school um, mostly paid for. And I chose a and because it was a, one of the few universities I applied that provided me funding opportunities and it had a great program. So for me, that was a no brainer that I didn't want to increase my student loan debt. So for those of you that are thinking about you know, what it's like to, to maybe be an undergrad and considering grad school, I think there's a general trend that people are staying in school longer. And I think that this is important to note right now with our economy and that it could be difficult to find a job. So if you're in a position where you might be finishing school in the next year or two and having to think about getting another degree or going to grad school, generally it shows that companies are looking for candidates with grad school experience and generally people are staying in school longer. And why do I think grad school is, is a good place to get skills? Well, some of the things that you learn in grad school translate to workplace skills. It demonstrates the skills that you can work independently, that you can manage your time and deliver on deadlines. Um, you can do some technical writing if you're writing a thesis. Sometimes you have to give technical presentations to your peers or to, uh, to your uh, teachers and things like that. So technical presentation skills are certainly something that is important in the workplace. You have to work with an extended team of people and um, sometimes that means you have to organize schedules and meet deadlines and things like that. And all of these things you learn in grad school, which are translated to workplace skills. Now, for those of you that might be going into the sciences and have an option of doing a thesis or a non-thesis option, um, some of the things that you do get with a thesis option, of course, are technical writing skills and technical presentation skills. Um, a non-thesis is more classroom time and it might be the, the faster option, um, but it sort of depends on what your vision is, what kind of job you wanna get. Sometimes the non-thesis is the way to go because you get your degree. And sometimes all it takes is that you can check that box if a job requires that you have a master's and it doesn't say that you had to have a thesis or a non-thesis option, that just means you pass the filter and sometimes that's, that's good enough. Of course, if you're in grad school, um, it would be great for you to have fellowship opportunities and to teach. And of course, that was my first introduction to physical geology is teaching physical geology to um, freshman students at university. And you know, to teach is to learn twice. And of course, those are great opportunities to build your skills, share your skills and share your passion. And of course, there's lots of scholarships out there that exist that may not take a lot of effort. So I recommend that if you are thinking about going to another university or thinking in, that you might need some financial support, just search for some scholarships and who knows what might be out there that could apply to you. If you're trying to enter the workforce, of course, it's really important that you have sharp interview and soft skills. And if uh, in COVID time, you might actually have to do an interview via Zoom online, and that's quite challenging. So if I recommend that you practice with friends and relatives. And of course, you can reach out to me as your instructor, and I'd be happy to do a, um, a mock interview with you or discuss any of those skills with you. And I recommend that you do a project that you present to your peers, or you might have that opportunity in a class. And of course, that gets the butterflies out and gets you more comfortable speaking and speaking intelligently and coherently and technically in front of your peers. If you have an opportunity to go to any conferences and share um, any of your work or research, um, that's a great way to interface with professionals as well. 
And sometimes I have to tell myself this too. You have to go outside your comfort zone and introduce yourself. And this is how you start building your network. And networking is really important to, um, to your profession and to your success. Because uh, building your network is building those relationships and you never know when that relationship will matter. Some communities can be quite small. So, you know, word of mouth is how you can get your foot in the door. And you have to build a good reputation for yourself. Like I said, if communities are small, people will know that, you know, you may not have the credibility or that you are a great candidate. And sometimes that's the deciding factor of how your resume gets from one stack to the other. Now, building those relationships and trust takes time and effort, but having technology makes it a lot easier. You can connect with people on LinkedIn or send a text or an email or even just do a video chat, which is much easier than necessarily trying to set up uh, for coffee dates and things like that in person. Connections may not just benefit you, but may benefit your network. Um, helping out a friend or a colleague could help you professionally later on. So it's in your best interest to, um, to build your community and put trust in the people that you build your relationships with. Now for, um, for geoscience specific, it's difficult to say, you know, what the future of geosciences is, especially with COVID. There's been a general trend that there's uh, a change in employment in geosciences in the last few years. And that could be because um, some industries are not recovering um, very well. Um, there's displacement of jobs through automation. There's a lot of uncertainty with uh, regulatory requirements and the environment um, associated with the environment for certain industries like in the oil and gas industry, for example, there's a lot of change in environmental standards. And so um, therefore it impacts, uh, it impacts those jobs as a geoscientist. So some of the things that you can do to learn um, to expand your network as a geoscientist is you can attend um, those Coast Geological Society meetings that I've put up there for extra credit for you, um, or there's other societies within the state and the region that can um, bridge that gap with other professionals. You can look for virtual opportunities, whether that's in the geosciences or not. And um, there's lots of those types of opportunities now to try to meet new people and extend your network. Like I've mentioned, LinkedIn is a great resource. And that sometimes if you put in a job resume, um, people go right to your LinkedIn profile and check you out and, and see uh, what your credentials are. So I recommend that you create a LinkedIn profile and make it professional. Of course, if you do attend conferences or you interface with people, you might think about a business card um, or if you can attend career fairs. Um, of course, there's also clubs and activities and within your community, who knows how you can interface with people. So like I said, your career changes and your career is also a balance. So you might uh, appreciate that you have the time and money to travel, but that might sacrifice uh, something else as part of your career. So um, balancing these three things is really what I think makes a great career. You have to do what you love, you have to do what you're good at, and you have to do what pays you well. So sometimes you might be in these other um, zones. And of course, you know, hitting the sweet spot is where you should, you should try and land. And that's what I've been doing with my career is trying to figure out what that sweet spot is and how to get there. So um, as, a, as, um, as a geoscientist and the professional, uh, as a professional, I should say in the last eight or so years, uh, I've had the experience of working in small and large companies. First was with Century Exploration Resources, which is a very small independent company. And um, I was working as a data scientist and I didn't really have any upward mobility. And that company was actually bought out and my job was moved to Dallas. And they said, do you wanna move to Dallas? And I said, no, thank you. So I had to find a new job. And that's when I got hired on with Chevron, which is a huge Fortune 500 company. And with that, there's lots of processes and layers and, um, and because of that, it was competitive and challenging. And uh, I really enjoyed it and I thought I was good at it, but of course things change. And my husband got a job in Ventura County area. And so I didn't wanna live in a different area than him. So 
I got a job with the Department of Interior working for the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, which is working for the largest employer in the country, the federal government. And of course, with that comes job stability and resources, but things take a little bit longer to happen and decisions can be um, can be made um, arbitrarily and things like that. So there's a lot of layers there too. And trying to find that balance has been a challenge for me. So one of the things that I like to do um, to, to try to bring more joy into that is to teach, to teach you all at Ventura County Community College. So that's my way of trying to share some of my experiences, some of my knowledge to you. Now, whether or not you go into the geosciences, is one thing that is true is that our generation is not like our parents' generation and you have to bounce around from company to company to move up. So in order to move up, you gotta move around. So like I said, you have to find that balance and your goals and priorities in life change. Now, as a geoscientist, what does that mean uh, going forward? What kind of career options are there? I'm in the oil and gas industry and the, you know, sort of the regulatory, but what does the future look like for someone who's entering the workforce now? So there's a professional exam that you can take to get certified in geology. And a lot of those who take that exam, um, are in environmental geology or hydrogeology um, and uh, engineering geology is another one as well. So those are some of the major disciplines. Um, looking at who takes those professional geology exams um, and looking at how that has changed over the last few years, I think having a technical certification has been trending upward and that employers might be looking for that um, professional geology cert or the professional engineering cert and things like that. Um, and that might be the case for other disciplines, but uh, generally speaking, maybe not just a bachelor of science is good enough. Maybe not a master's is good enough anymore. And maybe you do need those higher levels of education and certificates in order to be a competitive person entering the workforce. And now if we look at how industries are changing, this data was from pre-COVID, we can see that there's an increase in finance and insurance for the geosciences, which I think is really interesting because um, I actually know someone who went into this industry recently, and it's because uh, banks want to understand the investments if companies are saying they want to borrow millions of dollars to, to start um, you know, an oil company or to produce alternative energy sources. They would need staff to say, yeah, that's a good investment or like, no, you shouldn't give them money. So I think that's a really interesting um, uh, career choice. We see an increase in construction, transportation, uh, some local government, state government, and of course, less career <laughs> industry uh, opportunities in oil and gas, um, mining and things like that. So how has COVID affected the geosciences? Well, that's a little early to tell because we're only a few months into the pandemic. But generally speaking, it seems as though that a lot of people have been furloughed or let go um, because of the pandemic, which is, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure, across the board for a lot of other disciplines as well. And of course, with that, um, less work. So you'd expect that um, with less work to do that you're getting a lot more people um, furloughed and laid off. So some of the um, reasons why people are uh, uh, why, uh, are being laid off or why business is, is business is changing during COVID is some of it having to do with the regulatory restrictions and having access to these facilities and doing it in a safe way. Some of them could be from disruption of supply chain, um, which is across the board too. That's not specific to geosciences, but it's interesting to look at how companies are being affected by COVID. Now, some of the ways that you can look for internships, whether you're a geoscientist or not, is with the state and the government. And I highly recommend that you create a profile uh, and uh, upload a resume, and you can create a search for whatever discipline you are. And I'm sure that there's some state and government jobs that might provide some opportunities for you. So you can go to usajobs.gov and do a search. Um, you can also look at um, Cal. Um, California State Jobs, Cal Careers, you can do the same sort of thing. You can take assessments ahead of time so you qualify to apply for certain jobs. You can create a profile and create searches there too. 
So some of the main takeaways, whether or not you're getting a degree in geoscience or not, is that you have to get a degree of some kind. Just stay with it. I know it's challenging, especially right now when taking classes online. You have to embrace what makes you different and own it. And sometimes those that means that you get an opportunity because you are different. Um, or there are scholarships or fellowships out there that that um, that provide you opportunities that uh, that build your your career, that build your path. And it's okay to fail because not everyone's perfect. And sometimes failing helps you learn from your mistakes. And um, and I think that those, you know, working through that builds adversity and it also helps you see um, what kind of path might be the right fit for you. So with that, um, it's been a great uh, opportunity to teach you this year. And I hope that you um, feel free to contact me in the future if you ever need anything. And um, I hope that you have a good rest of your semester. Bye, everyone.